Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jess Elnor in Baltimore. Bush and Cheney may have invented it, but National Democratic Party leaders are full-fledged players in the 21st century national surveillance state. And the interest group pressures that now help to sustain its defenders in Washington work just as powerfully on Democrats as on Republicans. That's according to Thomas Ferguson, Paul Jorgensen, and Ji Chen. They have just posted a short version of their new report on Alternet and a working paper for the Roosevelt Institute titled Party Competition and Industrial Structures in the 2012 Elections, Who's Really Driving the Taxi to the Dark Side? We're now joined by one of the authors, Thomas Ferguson. He's a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, and a contributing editor at Alternet. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi there. So Professor Ferguson, what you're arguing here kind of flies in the face of conventional wisdom and the mainstream narrative of the 2012 election. Can you just break down exactly what you're saying? Okay, well, we're saying a lot of things, but I'll focus on the stuff that connects directly to the national surveillance state. Um, we started out trying simply to do a straightforward money and politics analysis of the election. Now, I say that fully conscious of the irony, because there's nothing straightforward about that. We don't use anybody else's data. We download it all from uh, the Federal Election Commission and the IRS, which does the uh, so-called 527 contributions, which are big, uh, it's a lot of money. Um, and then we sort of pour over it. We do a lot of computer techniques that nobody else does. I mean, I, I've talked about that before on this show, don't particularly feel the need to do it again. Um, and so we were sitting back and, you know, analyzing it. And then in our first stages of all of the study are pretty much the same. You sort of sit there and you try to figure out, uh, okay, let's take the entire business community and let's subdivide it into big business and the rest and look at those two samples, one everything and the other big business. So we do that. And in the uh, business as a whole, the big sample, what we discover is straightforward, which is that uh, Obama's support there was not very strong, just counting percentages of firms that contribute, about 24% did. Um, the Republican percentage for Romney was like 46%, much higher. And um, when we look at the big business sample, we find, you know, again, a disproportion between the Republicans and the Democrats, though this time everything shifted up. That is to say 76% of the big business firms in our sample uh, were contributing to Romney and about 56 for um, Obama. Now, you know, that what that looked like to us was the usual story, which is, yep, the Republicans are the party of big business, though we thought it was really pretty interesting. And this is one place where we start to depart from the usual narrative. Obama had a lot of support in big business, um, much more than any discussion of the campaign that I know of uh, would suggest. But where the story got really interesting for us is when we did our usual move, which is start looking at pieces of the business community, usually sectors first. Um, and there we quickly discover that in certain industries, Obama's support is running way higher than his average. Um, and those industries turn out to be six in particular, telecommunications, um, electronics, defense, um, software on the web, computers, and manufacturing for the web. Um, and then we realized in June of 2013, when the, the Snowden revelations hit, you know, from Glenn Greenwald and company at The Guardian and, just, and to some extent The Washington Post, um, we were looking at these results and said, you know, this is really very interesting. These sectors that are showing extremely high percentages of contribution to Obama are precisely uh, the sectors in which a large number of those firms uh, that are mentioned uh, are real active. And at that point, you know, we're, we know we have a really interesting conclusion, which is that uh, one of the Obama bastions of support, maybe the biggest of all, uh, is precisely those firms, the ones responsible for the surveillance, I should say, sectors in which those firms predominate. On the other hand, I can also tell you, without trying to go uh, through firm by firm, a lot of the folks uh, discussed in um, The Guardian and other publications, Google, Facebook, 
Apple, for example, they all contain substantial con contributions or contributors, because you can have both the firm and executives uh, contribute under our rules these days. Um, th they show up uh, for the Democrats in, in substantial uh, amounts. And as you point out, um, many Obama supporters um, were hoping that President Obama would rein in you know, what could be, what could have been seen as um, rampant surveillance and, uh, you know, wireless wiretapping uh, under the Bush-Cheney years. So what needs to be done to bring these companies, to bring these industries under heel and under some type of control? Okay, well, if I, I mean, if you actually look at the trace through the history of this stuff, what you find, is, first of all, we know from Tim Shorrock's really excellent book on this subject uh, that, uh, steadily forward from the Reagan era, the government privatized more and more of intelligence operations. And, you know, the Clinton people were uh, very big in that. But then the sort of big changes after 911, the whole sort of newly privatized operation then swells enormously in size. Uh, and so we begin, we're to the point where now, uh, two, say like two thirds of all the uh, intelligence expenditures, uh, Shorrock estimates are going, um, to the private sector. And, you know, I have to say, looking back on this now, this looks to me like an awful lot of other privatization efforts I've seen, um, where it turns out you get clientele politics. Uh, and certainly you get some very powerful interest group pressures. If you look at, I mean, there's a couple of studies, um, there's at least one study of the uh, amendment uh, that almost passed in the House of Representatives not long after the initial uh, revelations to rein in the uh, NSA, and there they showed you that um, there was a the correlation between districts with a lot of defense and what they were calling surveillance industry money, which is probably narrower than what I am, um, it, it was very high. And it's, that's pretty interesting and it's pretty scary. But you know, my take is the actual sort of, if you like, industrial interests here are now very deep, very big. Um, and what, you know, what looked like a problem of ideology, meaning what, what, high high top, what top policymakers or bureaucrats thought was legally or morally acceptable, is that's just the tip of the iceberg. You now have a huge interest group problem here. And you know, that, I think, poses the question of control completely anew. I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious to me, uh, looking uh, now, again, at all of this with somewhat, you know, keener eyes, um, that it's obvious that when Obama came in, yes, as you said, we all expected that he would rein in this, the ex, uh, so, sort of super extended national surveillance state from the Bush-Cheney era. Instead, what he did is fix a few of the most grievous errors, but then, you know, we know he was, in fact, secretly expanding uh, what was what was going on underneath in, in surveillance? The government was even offering to pay for some of the costs of firms uh, when they had to change their equipment. You know, which of course makes nonsense of their denials. They knew nothing about it. Um, and uh, we actually have here, I'd say, it's pretty scary, right? I mean, you've got a government that wants to collect nearly everything about you, uh, working through firms that also like that idea. And in fact, what they'd like to do is to you know, sell the information uh, there. This is kind of a closed loop. This is you know, not, I wouldn't have said this was the major problem. I, you know, I, I was, of course, like a lot of other people, uh, naive. So Thomas Ferguson, we certainly have a lot more to talk about, but we're going to end this part of the conversation here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.